Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us for our alumni webinar series. Uh, I'm Brendan Patterson, Associate Professor and Associate Dean in the Business School at York St. John University. And I've been asked to host this webinar as part of our York St. John University alumni series, Alumni Journeys, Creativity, Careers and Community. And before I introduce today's speaker, there's a few housekeeping matters just to let, make you aware of. So we will be hosting a Q&A at the end of our talk uh, as part of this webinar. We have some pre-prepared questions that we're going to be putting to our speaker uh, as part of this Q&A. But if you do have any questions that you would like to put to our speaker, then please do email us at alumni at yorksj.ac.uk and the team will pass on your questions. There's also an auto transcript that's appearing during the talk for increased accessibility. Uh, but please do be aware that this is always not always great, so uh, it may not translate perfectly. So I'm delighted to, to introduce to you our speaker today, uh, Nathan Fullwood. Nathan is the strategy director and co-founder of Create Future, an innovation and design company that drives sustainable growth through product and service design. Nathan has over 25 years of experience in brand and digital strategy. An early adopter of the internet and still mostly excited and optimistic about its possibilities, Nathan has worked with brands such as Orange, Expedia, Penwing Random House, Tesco Bank and Adidas. A skilled facilitator brand copywriter and design thinking advocate. He's also probably one of the top 10 tallest people in the business. And I'll take your word for that because we've both sat down, so we won't know whether or not that's the case in, um, online, but uh, top 10 tallest person is quite an accolade. <laughs> Nathan graduated from York St. John in 1995 with a degree in English literature and history. Before his beginning his career as a marketing manager, Nathan has gone on to become a director and co-founder of his own company. And I'm really delighted to be able to pass you over to Nathan and I look forward to talking to you after your presentation. Okay, so the, the brief was to, um, to discuss my, my chosen career, which uh, first things first, I found kind of quite interesting because I have never really chosen my career. I never really um, considered it. I, I think throughout the last 25 years and, and then before then I've, I've always really been guided by my interests and, and the opportunities that, that, that have come up. Um, as you said in the introduction, I studied history and English literature at, at St John's um, because I enjoyed them uh, and I was good at them, you know, not particularly because they were, were good for, uh, for career prospects. I, I looked up the recommended career paths for the courses that I'd taken on one of those kind of career finder things and and it, and it was suggesting things like a museum curator or a, or a librarian, um, both you know very worthwhile jobs and ones I'm sure I would enjoy, but I don't think they're ones that I'm kind of particularly uh, well well suited or suited for. Um, but regardless, I'm I'm very very happy with 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 the path the path that I've taken. You know, as you said in the intro, six years ago, I um, set up my own company with two good friends, um, a company called uh, Create Future, the, an innovation and design company. As you say, we, you know, we, we, we spend all day like innovating and um, de developing new products and new services for kind of some really interesting clients. Like uh, at the moment we're working with Adidas, uh, NatWest, um, as you mentioned Penguin Random House, we've worked on some large, large projects for them. Recently it's kind of taken me all around the world and, um, you know, enable me to employ sort of 19 incredible people, like a really, really good team and, and give give those people kind of opportunities to, you know, to, to grow, and, grow and develop. So I'm very kind of happy with where that kind of career of, of seemingly random choices has, has, has taken me. And I'll come back to talk a little bit about um, Create Future in a bit. Um, in terms of my time at, at university, uh, I haven't really given it much thought for, for, for quite a while, actually. So it's quite nice to sit down and, and, and think through the path um, to get there. I'm going to go back a little bit further. I, I moved from London to Chesterfield in uh, 1987. 
um, about 13, 14. Um, quite a bit of a shift for me coming from through close to you know central London through to, to a relatively small town, Chesterfield. And you know, the minor strikes were still kind of relatively fresh in the, the mid-80s. Um, you know, pit closures were we you know still feeling the effects of kind of like pit, pit closures. The town, Chesterfield's a very pleasant town, and about the time it was kind of quite economically depressed, I think you could you could say there wasn't an expectation really that any students would apply for university from my school. Um, only a handful of the lads in my my boys' school um, did. Um, but I, uh, you know, at the time of leaving school, I did relatively well, you know, in my A-levels as it, as it was and, um, you know, had no, while well, I was kind of had sort of like part-time jobs and things, there was no vocation that I was particularly interested in at, at that time. So, so I was I was really interested in in university. My parents kind of encouraged me encouraged me to apply. I remember I applied to three places. Uh, I did interview in Birmingham uh, for archaeology, um, but um, I was put off by that because um, you had to go on digs over the summer, and I, and I didn't think I was going to be able to afford you know the uh, the costs of going to um, going on these summer digs. Um, I knew I was going to have to kind of work over the over the summer months um, to kind of contribute to the costs of going of going to university. Um, uh, but actually, I'm happy with the way it worked out because, you know, I, you know, York was also one of one of my choices. And um, yeah, so, so I'm pleased that uh, I kind of ended ended up here. So I visited York. Well, actually, I knew. <laughs> so I visited York uh, for an open day, but I nearly I went to the wrong city. I went to Leeds. So I don't know if you know, um, it used to be called the Leeds University College of Ripon and York St John, and and uh, I, you know, relatively inexperienced, I, I kind of got a little bit confused by that and put myself on a train uh, to Leeds for the open day, and I was only only kind of really kind of uh, clued into the fact that I'd gone wrong somewhere when there were no no city walls. <laughs> that was how I was planning on getting my bearings once I once I arrived. But it wasn't too bad. I you know just jumped on the train and said you know forty minutes or something to come come back across. Um, and yeah, I think I knew sort of the day I, that, that day on that very first open day that, that, that um, York were, was where I wanted to, to, to study. Um, I still, still love the city, you know, it's absolutely, um, a beautiful city, kind of really rich in, rich in history. Um, I remember being told that, you know, it had something like 365 pubs, one for every day of the year. And as an 18 year old, that was kind of quite uh, influential in, in swaying my, swaying my decision. So, so yeah, I think I kind of always knew it was going to be York and I was really pleased to kind of, to get the place to kind of study at, at Ripon, New York. So I, um, I had a had a room off the quadrant. I had a room just off the quads um, in on Lord Mayor's Walk, um, and by some admin error, I got a kind of a room that was big enough for two people, and it was like a really decent size. It had like a fireplace and lead line book uh, bookcases and a couple of bay windows. Um, yeah, it was a bit. It was very different from everybody else's room, which was which was great. But as I mentioned before, that and having a kind of a PC, having the biggest room and, and having a computer meant that um, it was kind of where everybody kind of came before we went out and, and often after we, we came back, which was maybe not the best best for my studies, but was was good for the good for the social social life. Um, my um, my history lectures and seminars were in Gray's Court, which I don't believe is part of the um, the the university's uh, campus any, any, anymore. But um, you students probably will know it, you know, just inside the city walls, right next to the Minster. Um, which I mean, even to this day, I kind of like pinch myself in terms of the the privilege that it was to you know to study particularly like history, history in there, like inside the city walls, you know, in, you know, the long gallery or one of the seminar rooms off, off that kind of beautiful room in, 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 in Grace, in Grace Court. Um, there was a one particular day, I remember like we were discussing kind of some pivotal discussion amongst sort of like kings and generals in, uh, in, in, in one of the English, war, English Scottish wars and, um, and mentioning that this kind of treaty had been signed in this room and at this table that we're that we're sitting at, you know, so to have a kind of there must there are very very few places I think where you get the opportunity to to study in in somewhere where the the histories actually actually happens. Um, so really kind of grateful for that. 
I think another 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 opportunity that really turned out to become pivotal for me in, in my, my career and, and, and really important in my time at, at university was was an exchange to Ripon College in Wisconsin in the States um, in my second year. I studied over there for two semesters. I, I, I don't know if the university still has this as a, as a program or as the opportunities to travel, but that was um, yeah, that was that was a chance that as soon as I heard, you know, you could apply for, I was was all over. Like, you know, it was a stretch financially, kind of, to make it happen. But I'm I'm so glad that um, I got the opportunity to do it. I was particularly excited about two things. Well, one, the opportunity for for, for travel. The the other was um, was to play ba basketball in the US. Um, I, I was captain of the. Well, no, I was like, yeah, I did captain briefly, but I was very involved with our basketball team. In, uh, in York St. John, not that we were any good, uh, but uh, I, I enjoyed it and I wasn't wasn't too bad. Uh, and to study with a kind of particular Shakespeare scholar over there, um, a guy called Bill Martz, um, who was kind of uh, quite well known and quite quite character. Um, I I got there with a, there's, there's four of us I think studying from 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 York went went over there. Um, I sucked at basketball. I was like I'm six I'm six foot six and I played a lot of school and um, you know played on good teams in in the UK. But it's a, it was different. I, I eventually yeah I didn't make the first team, didn't make the second, didn't make the third, and uh, you know I kind of realised I was well behind the standard that's expected to of you over there. But I switched to soccer. So football which I'm not actually you know wouldn't class myself as being great at and then made the state team so just goes to show the sort of like differences uh cultural cultural differences uh at the time um certainly the Shakespeare scholar Bill Marx wasn't a disappointment um really still remember that you know vividly the time I got to spend uh in those lessons but also um studying American pop culture um post-Vietnam pop pop culture with um I forget his name, but he was a veteran of the Korean and Vietnamese War. He'd also been really involved in sort of like Haight Ashbury movement. So he'd been right in the middle of a lot of these kind of post-war changes uh, to to American American culture. And um, again, really, um, really great opportunity just to study study over there and study those 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 topics. But within that time, the pivotal that moment was was being introduced to their computer lab. Um, they um, had a small computer room uh, where the students could work, but um, importantly, this was connected to something called the internet. You know, um, this was like the first time I'd certainly kind of come across it. Um, it was pre-browser, no Google, you know, no World Wide Web even, you know, it was just a set of kind of connected computers all by text. You know, through it, we could access a limited number of our academic resources. Um, we could join chat groups, play kind of simple online games for the, for the first time. Um, and I got an email address, which I was kind of really excited about. Um, uh, the only problem was that, like, I didn't know anybody else in the world with, with an email address. Certainly, nobody back up back, back at home had one. You know, so this was uh, in probably in 1993, I think. And I, I looked it up. I was taught there's, there was 15 million people online in, in 1993, compared with uh, five uh, billion today. Um, I wish uh, I wish I'd had the foresight, you know, to tell you that I immediately saw how this would this technology would change the world, and you know, I came home, you know, I quit my course, I started an internet search business, and that I sold for for, for billions, and and that's my entrepreneur story. But unfortunately, it's very very much not the case. You know, it would definitely kind of take me a few years before the internet really started to become a thing back in the UK. The rest of my college time, uh, university time, it didn't, didn't feature at all. Um, but that, ex that early experience really did um, uh, stick with me. Uh, and it eventually helped me get my first kind of like proper job, in, you know, post-university. I think having that, um, that early access to it, I kind of followed it. I, wherever I found an opportunity through cyber cafes and stuff, which was bringing up, I would be on there and, and, and um, following this, this technology as it, as it, as it developed. Um, anyway, I, I graduated. I graduated with a two two. You know, much to the disappointment of my mum uh, and myself. Uh, but still, it's uh, it's a it's a BA honours. Uh, you know, I very much enjoyed uh, the graduation ceremony in the in the Minster, which um, which I really hope that kind of people watching this video uh, will get an opportunity to experience. That is definitely something that will stay with you for for a lifetime if you if you get that experience. Um, my first job was post that was in the shadow of 
the, of the Minster itself. It was a, a shop called High and Mighty, which I think is a little defunct now, but it used to be a shop that closed for, for big and tall men. I previously mentioned kind of six foot six, and my colleague at the time was about five foot high and five foot across, which which, which still tickled us both that we were kind of the, the very representation of, of, of High and Mighty working in there. But eventually I moved down to um, Stratford-on-Avon and got my first kind of like proper job, I guess you would say there, which was in, um, it's actually a toy company, it's kind of a toy plastics company. And this, I got the job because I knew computers, I knew what this intranet thing was. And my first job was to, um, uh, was to computerize their warehouse and ordering systems, uh, something I had absolutely no qualification to do, but um, was quite capable to do it so that they could take orders online. Uh, from from their from their B two B customers, you know, over the ex, uh, the extra net and extra net as it, as it was known. So customers like Woolworths again, somebody else sees something else that we just we don't have anymore as uh, passed into into obscurity. Um, but I guess despite despite that that first job and you know my love of computers and I never really wanted to saw sort of like IT as a career. Um, not really too concerned about like the nuts and nuts and bolts of it. Eventually, to get into kind of like digital. Uh, digital roles but not not really in the kind of like the, the coding sort of side and things so my, my role right there ended up being more um sales i guess and sales and marketing and then um uh i eventually moved up to leeds got a job in recruitment and it was through recruitment i think you know short stint in recruitment that i i kind of probably set me on on this this career path one of the one of the jobs that passed my desk was for the press association and it was the press association if you don't know is a core of journalists that report on everything that's going on in the uk uh, and then they sell that news to um to the different news outlets and the news outlets put their own spin on it um, and they have been providing that service to newspapers for years and were trying to figure out what they needed to do um in this new world of kind of internet sites that was that were popping up um so i helped them to do that i joined and, and we, we we i created some of their first digital products um and helped them sell those products in to sites like aol.com and you know and the newspaper sites that they themselves were starting to do the first their first websites and needed needed uh, content for them um so a really interesting role my first digital role I would say in my first kind of role in kind of like product development and and but still with a, a business development angle to it um as part of that we decided that well, that, that that turned into a company called Ananova which was uh um the world's first virtual newscaster um way ahead of its time but uh you, what you could do is kind of create a, a personalized feed of news that was interest to you um, which sounds like really um you know, standard stuff now, but at the, at the time was 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 pretty groundbreaking. And then have this kind of virtual newsreader um, looked a little bit like Kylie Minogue, but with with green hair, actually read it out to you over the phone. The only problem being that nobody had enough bandwidth then to to be able to actually actually use the thing. Um, the real value in that company was um, we had a core of about 80 people who were writing specifically for the web for the first time. So they were writing news stories uh, it structured in a different way with different headlines and broken down, you know, and, and tagged you know, appropriately so that it could be, um, you know, uh, repurposed in, in different ways on, on internet sites. And, and that the, the, um, the company called Orange saw the value in that, the, the telecoms company. So I ended up working for, for Orange. Um, I worked for Orange for um, a couple of years or 18 months, I think, um, helping them to develop their early digital products, um, sports, SMS products in particular, but also um, uh, how they could sell digital products in their physical stores, I'm trying to figure that out before. The, the shops were all about selling handsets that you could hold, you know, so but how did you sell something to people where there was, it was, it was in the cloud or it was just floating around, you know, in, in the air. So, so, so come and you know, try to figure that, that, that challenge out. Uh, at that point, my career took a year off, came back. And then uh, when I came back, I joined a digital agency in Sheffield. And then after a year, I moved up to, to Edinburgh. Uh, and in Edinburgh, I cut my teeth for nearly 10 years at a full service digital agency um, uh, as part of the senior management team. So I helped to grow that company from about um, 22 people to about 150. 
um, uh, working on all sorts of kind of, you know, starting with website projects, but then building up really into full scale sort of digital transformation sort of uh, projects uh, across the UK and, and the US. Um, and that company again was, was acquired um, and that as an opportunity to, to leave, um, I worked for a short while as a brand agency to, um, which was good as an innovation director for a brand agency, well-respected agency up here. Um, and that's the point after there were actually two of my former colleagues, uh, Dave and Jessica kind of approached me to discuss starting a small consultancy of our own, which brings us almost up to date, up to date, you know, so as I say, the previous 10 years I've been um, delivering these increasingly large digital projects, large web and, and software projects. Um, I am, uh, to the surprise of many around me, a, a Prince2 qualified project manager, which is kind of very rigorous, kind of waterfall process. It's used for de developing um, big infrastructure projects with, with low risk, you know, if you want certainty that everything's going to happen. And that was the approach that typically had been applied to software development, but over this period of that time, um, I've been helping that um, agency move to um, an agile approach, which um, is it is more iterative. Um, it has a kind of like test and learn approach to it. It's very comfortable with with change. You know, um, it works very very well for something in software, which is the requirements. You know, kind of change change a, a lot. Um, and when I moved out of you know, software and digital products and into like brand and, and marketing. Certainly one of the, the eye openers for, for me was that those kind of, that kind of work was still developed in a very brand, in, in a very waterfall way, you know. Um, so in fact, really the, the kind of agile or lean principles of customer centricity, being comfortable with change, you know, test and learn, these kind of things were really not being used anywhere in businesses outside of IT. The language was just, was, just wasn't used. Um, and that was one of the reasons I was really keen to, to do something new um, and see if we could bring these principles of working faster, working very closely with our client teams, you know, to a wider range of, of challenges, um, you know, but primarily to the kind of the, the, the development of new products and, and services. And that's the, that's the founding principle really of, of create future was to bring these different skill sets of you know strategy creativity um and service design um brand it's some brand experience together um uh, but really try and deliver them um based on the kind of fundamental agile and design thinking approaches so the company was started in a granny flat um attached to jessica one of the one of the founders um we uh i think we i think we put something like we had 10 grand each to put into it just to pay for our wages like literally our own living costs if we needed to if we didn't get any work for the first six months you know which i think you need to 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 think that way you know plan for the worst and you know hope for the best so um but um we didn't take any clients from our former from our former agencies um but we won through our network and we won um, a new client every week for the first five weeks, I think it was, which was great. So it meant we had like work for the first six months sort of like lined up, you know, so we would always been in the black and touch wood, you know, we, we have, have, have since and kept, kept busy and that, that kind of growth continued. So after a couple of months, we were able to bring in a couple of part-time people to help um, one intern who's gone on to do kind of great things and something else who we eventually employed. And then, um, we moved to Edinburgh City Centre a little while afterwards, got our first office, which is where I am now in front of this very kind of raw shark-esque sort of wallpaper. Um, we continue to then kind of, you know, we met the first time it was um, Gareth actually, he's still with us sort of six, five years later and has progressed really, really well. Um, we continue to grow the team. We have a real focus on finding and developing kind of good, good people. It's, it's definitely our belief that um, healthy, happy people do, do, do good work. And we kind of invest a lot in, in that. We have very progressive ahead of the time, I think, policies around things like, um, you know, around, around men menopause, paternal leave, you know, these kind of things, which I think eventually follow and kind of catch up, which is, which is great, great to see. But we also do some really just nice things for the team, like, um, uh, 
uh, we have these things called bountiful breakfasts where we'll bring speakers in kind of to talk and give people advice on like uh, breath work or nutrition sleep you know um managing anxiety uh, these these kind of things we bring experts in to kind of talk to talk to the team all of these things have been um uh, really kind of helpful uh in, in yeah just bring a kind of nice tight tight team who kind of um are really well supported to, to do good work i think another quite seminal or a pet so i should say pivotal moment in my early career here was i got the opportunity to go to san francisco for a week on a trade mission and um part of that was visiting people like uh, dropbox and google and um bunch of other and facebook's new campus at the at the time um but but i also got the opportunity to visit a company called ideo um and ideo if you don't know them are one of the world's kind of leading product design companies they pretty much created the category um in those sort of 70s 80s you know they designed things like the first mouse you know um and they really are the people who championed design thinking principles um and so getting to spend some time with them and seeing the environment that they worked in was, was instructed. They had a, a space really designed to foster collaboration uh, and curiosity uh, in a big warehouse a space that we can, could be configured in different ways and set up for different teams to work on different things, but still kind of cross pollinate ideas. And so coming back from San Francisco is a priority for us to find a space that one well, not as big <laughs> allowed us to do that so we have a, a really nice studio space a couple of miles from here um in also still in edinburgh which which is exactly set up for that for kind of workshops and workshopping it's a very kind of creative open open space this is our more this is a more grown-up location in, in edinburgh city center um so the, the the team the create future continues to do well you know winning winning clients uh winning winning work and you know interesting projects we were working in um so we were working globally so we were working in places like madrid singapore uh, atlanta and then the pandemic hit um you know uh, this is not the doom and gloom bit this is not where i go oh the pandemic hit and we had to like lay everybody off it was it was a change you know it was uh it was a, a bump in the road, you know, uh, but something that affected everybody. You know, we we literally had to pivot online halfway through projects. You know, like literally, we, often we will go in and work with a client for a week or two weeks on site, and then we were told you can't come in tomorrow. Um, right? Well, how do we continue the work? So, you know, lucky for us, our entire business was built on kind of Google products. Um, so, you know, Gmail type um, and. Um, you know, um, video conferencing and stuff was all kind of pretty pretty familiar to us so it was very easy for us we just added in Miro added in Zoom and you know then we had the kind of suite of tools that we needed and you know we spent that kind of like time just tweaking what we did to make it work in, a, in an online world and, and once clients kind of got over the panic the work uh, in the pipeline came back online and, and then new work kind of came online so the, the first year we kind of pretty much stayed the same in terms of headcount and, and turnover we used this time where it was clear that it was a little bit quieter we used this time to do a lot of work behind the scenes in terms of kind of all structure and systems and, and tweaking people's roles now this this time was only about 12 12 of us it might seem like overkill for a company you know size 12 people to you know to be thinking about all structures and systems and processes but if there's one piece of advice i would give is always to you know to design your company um as if it's much bigger than, than it is you know the importance of having a good operating system as we kind of like call it for your company even if there's one of you or three of you is is vital you know because it's, it's having those foundations in place that enable you to scale when they when the opportunities come and it's just that investment in in time and processes now stop things from snowballing you know becoming a problem further down the line you know you, you sort of get visibility of any issues um I mean, essentially it's how you grow value in a, in a in a company is is by having those good systems that you can that you can build build upon so the second year of the pa pandemic we grew by about 75 percent um so we were up to close to the headcount that we have now um and last year we tipped over the sort of one million turnover um mark or revenue mark for the for the first time which is um quite quite the achievement and we're kind of projected to grow again this year and and and, and the next and we're investing uh, in, in that so as i say that's that structural changes we made puts in a really good good place to continue the growth 
um, allowing us to add more like fee earning consultants, if you like, on top of the, you know, the, the people who are coming, the systems and the people that were helping us to deliver that work. Which kind of brings us up to date. Um, the, the the challenges I would say in in our industry that we've that we faced, other than this, which you know is um, we'll talk a little bit about hybrid, is one is is consulting um, the work that we do, um, consulting work uh, when you're selling services is um, is patchy. It's uh, you know it constantly having to kind of like go out and find the next piece of work, and a piece of work might be six weeks, eight weeks, twelve twelve weeks, and you know, and then that work takes time to, um, to 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 spin up, you know, to be to be to be signed off. And then you have to be um, relatively kind of comfortable with the fact that your pipeline is going to go like this, your revenues are going to go going to go up and down like this. So the things that we can do and the things that we're trying to do to smooth that out, um, but really, it's a bit of a nature of the beast. Um, the other thing I think is is as kind of the other side of the coin is that is the, is the business development marketing is kind of almost like constant that you need to, to do that. I think we have a strong brand at Create Future. Um, we've invested a lot in that because it's what we do as well. You know, we understand it. Um, we have a good good reputation. We have a good network. And our business to date has really been built on um, that network, you know, of doing good work, of people recommending us or people quite often taking us when they move into to a new role. Um, one mistake I think we made is is, is an underinvested in marketing to this, to this point. Um, we are correct in that by hiring our first kind of full time marketing manager, as opposed to trying to do it ourselves in between in between jobs. Um, and we're investing more in kind of business business development. Um, our FD is always sort of saying we should be spending sort of like ten percent of a turnover on, on on marketing, and we haven't been close to that. And we, we're looking to address that balance next uh, in the coming months. Um, I think the other challenge will be then is this um, adjusting to hybrid, as, as I spoke before, particularly about making sure that the team are getting what they need. A priority is to make sure that we're delivering good work you know, so effective work. So how how do we best do that, you know, if we're not all in the, in the same room? And we've put some, some quite, not hard and fast rules, but proper guidance in like, you know, so we've actually found it's easier if we're delivering work for a client. If not everybody's in the room, then everybody's online. So we insist that rather than having this kind of like half and half. But we are in a position now where we are getting more and more opportunities to bring people back together in, in person, which is great. You, you just get a different energy and a different, um, uh, and often a better outcome, I think, if you do that. But but certainly, it's going to be. I don't, I don't think that's we're ever going to go fully back to fully back to that. So, being able to um, look after our teams as they work remotely, support them to, to come in at the right times that, that are right for them, and then also design our systems and processes to work for, for with our clients um, remote is is good. But then just before I finish, was just kind of reflecting really on the joys, I think, of, uh, of, of, of what we do. And one is, you know, this, this business has enabled me to, you know, to develop our own approaches, you know, to, to how, we, how we work. You know, literally, it's a blank canvas for us as to if there's you know, something we want to try, then we, we have that opportunity to do it. You know, from we used to work in five-day sprints through to um, we now, we still use those as a tool, but we've expanded that out into more of a kind of a longer term design thinking approach, working through the stages of exploring a problem, defining it, designing a solution, prototyping, testing, and so on over a longer period of time. Um, and that's been great to, to build that approach into something that feels like a toolkit um, that, that we can and delivers repeatable results. Um, the challenge for us now, I think, is with the opportunities that you know we get to expand our research capability, you know. Um, getting the insights is vital to what we do and um i think the more time we can we can spend doing that and the better we can get at doing that is going to help us um the other side is we, we, we're investing in growing our kind of business analysis kind of capabilities so once we've had that idea and once we've told the story of that idea and we've got a um a, we validated um, with customers that it is a good idea and, and they would go for it. Um, how do we support the client in operationalizing that? You know, so things like market sizing, you know, um, development roadmaps, um, you know, the you know the people that are going to be needed, people, process, and technology that are needed to you know to implement that um, is something that I guess the, where the big consultancies excel. 
it's not really expected of consultancies of our size and we, we want to get better at that through hiring and, and, and training but really the, the best part of of having you know your own business is and certainly for me and the driver for me is is the, the people aspect of being able to 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 support people's careers you know to to find great people to develop people to learn from them be surprised by them you know but also the stuff like you know being able to help people like the, our members of our team have been able to like buy their first home, you know, because we've given them that job security or start a family, you know, because they've got that, that financial um, security. But also we give them the opportunity to, you know, to be creative or to, to, to learn new things and to work on interesting stuff. And, and that's the drive for me and has been for a long time in terms of like when I'm trying to find work to do it. Uh, I want to find something because oh, Gareth would be great at that or that would be a great opportunity for Laura, you know, and that's that more than anything else is what... Um, what drives me to um, to try and grow grow the business to provide more opportunities? Um, how are we doing for time? I think we're okay. Just to, like, I've got maybe five more minutes, and we will get to yeah, if if even that. It's great. Yeah. So I think, as I say, it was it has been a good opportunity, and if I've gone on a little, it's because I don't get this opportunity for this sort of self of self reflection. Really, reflecting on my career, I think. Couple of things came to mind. One was more recently is that I never considered myself an entrepreneur. Um, it was never in my career path to start my own business. I just didn't think it was something that that like, ah, people like me, whatever that is, did. You know, um, I, I'm really glad I took the plunge. You know, I'm really glad that, um, and I wouldn't have done it if Dave and Jessica hadn't asked me. Um, I. It's surprising when you get into it. Um, 90 percent of it is exactly like working for somebody else you know it's just the 10 percent of it is often you know the, the the decisions that you're making for yourself that and when things go really well and when things don't go so well you feel a lot more keenly you know but if you're if you're doing a role already and you decide to do that for yourself 90 percent of what you're doing is doing exactly the same as if you were taking it i'm an employee of great future as much as if it's founder and, and director most most of the time um and i think luckily for me i think that the people i started with jessica is is you know it had previously been in a uh, managing director role you know um and so certainly you know her interest in in those systems and, and making sure that we did everything properly from a from a business point of view really really helped um i think the other reflection was that you know never having had that plan and i still still don't <laughs> to, to 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 an extent that's kind of worked um worked for me um alongside that i think you know the things that have worked for me in my career when i reflect is one is following my interests if there's something that i'm interested in i learn about it talk to people about it um you never know when it's going to that interest is going to turn into something and it's going to come useful like you know i kind of collect all sorts of things in my head and then you, you know for me i never know when the next thing's going to come around the corner you know enough about that for it to be to be useful but if there's something that you're really interested in you know follow that see um see where those conversations with people take you i think the other thing that's worked for me is listening to advice not i should have done it. i could have done it earlier um i uh, it took a little while to, um, to to appreciate the value of it, of of, of listening to people and, and acting on that on that advice. Um, hopefully, it goes without saying, but treating people with respect is really important if you want a long career. Um, and again, this is this has never really been a massive problem for me, but I've, I've realised the importance of it is just like not comparing yourself to others as you go through is in terms of like um, where you think you should be at any one, one time, how much money you should be earning or what job you should be in, it, you know, it, it, it's a uh, fool's errand to think that way and it causes you a great degree of anxiety. And, you, and if you think that way, you are never gonna be enough, I don't think. So I think um, being comfortable, if, if something feels right and it feels good for you, enjoy that. And I think the more you then just enjoy that, the opportunities will follow. Uh, as opposed to kind of always thinking, oh, what's the next thing? Where should, where should we be going? And tying yourself in knots with that, because as I said, grass is, grass is really greener. Um, I think not having a plan might feel uncomfortable for, for some people, but I recently read this book called like The 100 Year Life, and this is the last point I want to, want to finish on. It's a really good book. Um, uh, it's been instrumental to me in, in like so many ways. It's written by a, um, a psychologist and an economist. I forget their names, but... Um, it's, it's really well worth a read. 
in summary, like most of the people watching this, uh, I imagine if they're a little younger than certainly than me, um, will live to around 100 and should, if they look after themselves, like live relatively healthy lives. You know, but the old models of like, you know, learn, work, retire and die just don't fit this this new lifespan. You know, there, there are these Victorian institutions that we still mostly, you know, and working patterns that we still work with. You know, what you learn today won't be relevant in 50 years time. You know, if you try and do the same career for 50 years uninterrupted, you'll die of boredom, you know? And, and if you retire early, if you work and you retire early with no sense of purpose for your later years, you'll be depressed, right? You're, you're just, you're, you see it time and time, time again. You know, you need to be building um, interests in a, in a network or finding second careers and so on. So this is this has all changed. This is something that I think has been really important for, for, for me. It's, it is good to have a, a plan, and but I think it's it's better to have like a purpose and be willing to like embrace change within within that, you know, so that you can make the most of your make the most of your of your of your hundred years. And that's what I'm doing now. It's like you know, this isn't this isn't it forever. You know, I think I'm quite comfortable with like, to do this for a few years, and then I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity. Of maybe maybe studying again, maybe come back to Riffin and York St John, and and then see what the what the next career the next career might be. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nathan. It'd be fascinating to hear about you know your journey to university whilst at university and then you know reflecting upon your your career path i hope that's what you're expecting to hear about brilliant no, I okay, good. Good. Okay, good. Really let you continue um and interesting you talk about that kind of sense of purpose i'm not sure if you've come across any of aaron Hurst's work on the purpose economy because right. he talks very much about that that kind of looking for a sense of purpose and what we do in terms of our work but also how that impacts upon our wider life and the things and skills and, and experiences that we develop as, as part of that so um yeah, a, lot really of work, a lot of work that we do with clients is, um, you know, I, I, there's, I wouldn't say there's a backlash. There is a bit of cynicism, probably healthy cynicism around like purpose in business, mm. particularly ones who maybe got some kind of like lofty purpose statement, but it uh, seems to bear no relation to the decisions that they're making within within that business. But a lot yeah. of what we do is actually about either helping clients find that meaningful purpose um, mm. and then how how is that then translated into um experience principles off or, or into you know to business activities you know that will that yeah. you know that will, that will help substantiate the company's company's purpose and, and yeah and I, i'm not familiar with his work but i assume it's the, the importance of having that kind of clear purpose in terms of bringing people into the organization who are aligned with that you know that their purpose is aligned with with the way that the individual with the individuals within your organization want to behave so. yeah absolutely and focusing not just on the economic motive but the wider social environmental aspects yeah. as well yeah. which are yeah. really important absolutely i think reflecting on what you were talking about i i hope that many of our students who are, are, are watching this will recognize the parallels in terms of your experiences of coming to university you know first in family to go to university uh, and many of our students coming to Oxford John today in 2022 you know our first in family opportunities to travel uh, which sound amazing I and mean, what an opportunity to be able to go and actually be one of the first you know people to have a, an email address but no one to communicate to but it's the first time I've been on a flight I remember going over to yeah. Chicago so yeah uh, so and again, you know, our students today do have opportunities to travel you know, all across the world, um, which is um, amazing and opens up so many opportunities, just like uh, the ones that you described. Um, and obviously, at the moment, you know, cost of living concerns. You know, it's, it, we're all dealing with with that. You talked about within your own organisation about how you support your team. Um, you know, how you weather the pandemic sounds incredible, and to see that growth. 75% growth is, is phenomenal. Um, how are you dealing with the challenges of cost of living? You know, what's your thinking around in terms of supporting your team? And uh, you know, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, so it's a really good, really good question. These conversations that we're having with people, everybody here, um, as I say, we have a great team of people who are like committed to, to, to being here, but for, for the right reasons. And those are not just the, the economic reasons you know they, they recognize that um this is where they want to be to develop their career to kind of give them those those opportunities but 
the financial part of it is a kind of a big, big component. So people's um, personal development plans, as, as we kind of call them, we set out what it is that they hope to achieve um, in terms of their own practice uh, in the next kind of years it are also linked to kind of fairly clear and well-documented progression paths. So they know they go through these things, you know, they'll be recognized in terms of um, relative like seniority and, and, and pay rewards. We, we have just a general kind of cost of living um, uh, pay rise is kind of pegged anyway, you know, and, and had beforehand, um, and those have been adjusted. You know, it's kind of to, to, to kind of recognise what we're what we're going through. It's really difficult, and this is a personal decision. I'm reading another book at the moment um, called, called Happy Money, which is uh, is is being quite useful in terms of um, it talks about um, e money EQ and and IQ. You know, about having a good relationship with money uh, and understanding how, how much you need and where you're spending and why you're spending your money kind of critically like are you are you spending in a way that's aligned with your values or are you spending money out of anxiety or fear or or, or, or need for status and, and then these again these are kind of like these are, these are conversations that we can have. We, we need to support people materially as well, but we can support people in terms of feeling, hoping to feel kind of recognizing that wealth is, is there's, there are other sources of wealth than to just your kind of like bank bank balance. And that's can be like the, the, the people in the network around you. I think I appreciate that it sounds like a bit of a woo woo and a glib answer when people are kind of really struggling with, with rising costs. But I think being able to, to change your attitude to finances and think in the long term and come from a place of, um, security and abundance as opposed to like fear and scarce, scarcity can be can be really helpful when you're trying to decide how to spend those those limited limited resources absolutely think you back to your time at york st john you, you yes. did your first degree in english literature and, and history how do you think that the background in that subject area has helped benefited your career in, in business? Yeah, massively. Um, in particular in the line of work which I've eventually got into, which is, is problem solving. It's consultancy mm -hmm. and, and it's problem solving. And then it's communicating the, the outcomes of, 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 of that. One of the things that I really have always reasons I'd liked both of those and I do enjoy, and actually as I've got older, I'm more into science, uh, the sci um, to, to science. Um, but in terms of studying it, I like history and English because there's no black and white. There's no right and wrong answers. You know, everything is subjective to, to a degree um, and in an interpretation. And it's any text, any period of, of history is is open to, to interpretation in, in, in different ways. And that, that had always appealed um, to me to be able to look at problems in a, in a different way. In terms of giving me the tools, you know, both of those, both of those, um, courses you know history and english gave me those tools to yeah to 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 dissect and to look at problems in different ways you know to kind of approach approach them in a different way and then into you know really in terms of kind of communicating them them better you know the importance of being able to kind of communicate communicate those ideas well and in english literature looking at the different kind of structures and the ways that stories are are told has mm. been um, really useful to me in terms of again selling in a strategy if you yeah. if you like and what a great place to study that you know you mentioned Grace Court and your you know, history. Yeah, it's just yeah. City. yeah. You mentioned around you know people having multiple careers uh, and the, the, the kind of varied career paths that people take. And you know we're very mindful here. That we're preparing students for for careers for roles that perhaps don't exist yet. Yeah. So yeah. You know, social media content manager wasn't a role that was around twenty years ago, but you know now is very important. So thinking about kind of skill development, transferable skills, do you have any advice in terms of the types of skills students should focus on in terms of developing uh, in, as they prepare for going out into the world of work? Yeah. Um, it's the softer skills, isn't it? I think they're the ones that are always reference, but they're vitally important. I, yeah. And I, they are things I, I think wish I'd got more experience at kind of at, at university before going into the world of work. Um, the ability to collaborate with others, you know, to work kind of closely with others and to recognize others, your own strengths and weaknesses in, and others' strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
and 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 the interplay in between those. So I think you know not just collaboration, being good at working with each other, but to really get into that, to understand how to how to support people who think differently and work in in different ways to get them to get the best out of them so i think kind of collaboration absolutely vital um communication but then also um uh this flexible mindset you know this ability to um to to be willing to take those transferable skills and actually try to trans transfer them it, it change is never as scary once you're in it or you've gone through it as it seems when you are um when you're considering it mm. when it was a prospect some people get quite excited about it and they need it and they thrive on it but regard i think most people it's it's more daunting you know it's, it's it's but actually most most things once you kind of get into them they're exciting they're good and you and it'll often leave you in a, in a better position before so and once you've been through some of the this a couple of times you get more comfortable more comfortable with it so i can't say there's any one one skill i'm not going to tell you you should be into machine learning or or, or anything like that you know i think you have an interest in all of these things that are going on but it's it's people with mm. good good people skills communication and collaboration and kind of a and, a and a growth mindset i think those those things are probably the most important um, and then that's what I look for, or what we look for. Yeah. Great future. What advice would you give to somebody who's thinking about starting their own business? Uh, I would say to do it and to take it seriously, consider it seriously. But in that taking it seriously, take it seriously, do the work, do the planning work. Um, you know, uh, find a mentor, ping me, you know, if you want to talk through the kind of like tools as you go through. But there are lots of resources, you know, don't, I'm sure there are some people that it works when they just kind of like quit, do figure it out and they go. We we went through a process of, you know, just refining and refining and testing and getting feedback on the proposition that we were thinking about until a point where we just couldn't say, we had no good reason not to do it anymore. You know, we couldn't talk ourselves, we tried to talk ourselves out of it. And then you get to a point where this makes sense. You know, we've spoken to enough people about it. We've done the numbers, got a plan, we've got our feedback. It, it, it should work. We have a high degree of confidence that, that it's going to work. So yes, do it, but make take advantage of the tools. You know, even as simple as starting with a business model canvas, you know, or even but, but talk to people, get some advice on it, get feedback on it. Critical feedback. Ask people who are not just going to say, yeah, that's great. You know, go for it. Like, you know, all the friends will tell you that they'll support you and then you won't get the orders on the other side, right? And because they just want to help you. So, so talk to people outside of your network um, to, to get that feedback. And there, there are lots of opportunities that you sh shouldn't be too difficult to, 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 to find that. Um, but as I say, it's it's um, it's not as scary as you think. And, and what's the worst that can happen? Like, you know, I think, you know, if it, do, if it doesn't work, you, you can try something else. You can go back into, you know, to, to, to an employed uh, employed role. Um, I would certainly, um, yeah, I left it until I was... Uh, 41 or 42 before starting you know so you don't have to do it immediately um or you can choose to do it early early in your career but i at some point i think everybody should should consider it and look into it seriously and you're absolutely right as well about that. getting feedback you know being challenged by others is really helpful and, and learning from those different perspectives as part of that yeah. that process yeah if you could go back to your younger self as you arrived here at york st john on your first day uh what piece of advice would you give yourself um then having you know got to the point yeah. where you are now that's a good question i uh i wouldn't change anything in terms of the outcome I, i'm really happy with you and I, I don't think you can really think that way one, one regret i would say is um i, I wish i'd <laughs> studied harder from being honest i had something like eight hours of lectures a week and it felt like that was a burden to get to eight hours of lectures. i kind of what i didn't realize is when you get into a job is you're doing eight hours a day of graft day after day after day and i think if i'd known <laughs> if i went back now i would lap up that opportunity to you know to work for 20 30 hours a week still have like time you know and uh, that would give me given me all the time i needed to attend the lectures read the books think about them do the writing and, and probably still have time you know for other for other interests i did not appreciate what an opportunity it was to be given that time you know to to, to do it and in particular something that i you know i i loved like history and english 
you know, I, I did I did the web. I I could have could have done more, uh, and I think uh, in hindsight, I I could have made more of that opportunity, read more, studied more, got more got more out of it. You know, that said, I had a rich and varied social life at uh, at York St John as well, and I, I very much enjoyed that aspect of of my years there. Well, that leads me on to my final question, which is your favourite memory from your time here at York St John. God, I have loads. Um, I draw. It was the first week. It was the first week. I just still think about it. I still think about turning up, you know, being given your room and just being thrown into it with so many, so many different people from different backgrounds. And you have the same conversations with everyone. Oh, you know, what did you study? What are you here to study? Where are you from? And so on. But you make friends in that first week or first couple of weeks that have lasted me you know, or well, half a lifetime now, you know, and um, I just remember how exciting, how exciting that was, you know, coming to such a beautiful campus, but but really it was that opportunity just to, just to, just to meet people. I still, um, still grateful I, I got the opportunity um, and made so many kind of good, good, good friends and uh, uh, in, in that week and um, yeah, you know, they, 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 they're what made, they're what made my, you know, my, my, my university years so much so much fun so probably that yeah. fantastic well nathan thank you so much uh, for your time today it's been fascinating to hear about mm -hmm. you know, your, your journey to university your time at york st john but then also hearing about your career and the challenges um, and the opportunities that have taken you you've been involved in and to really hear about you know your organization at the moment and how you're working with people and supporting people in, in the work that you do it really has been fascinating so Thank you very much for your time. I hope it was useful and I'm very happy and very easy to find online uh, on LinkedIn. It's probably best. So I'm, I'm really happy to connect with anybody if they want to, to dig deeper into anything that we've, we've, we've talked about. That's great. Well, thank Thanks you very, very much. much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.